Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Zaya. طيب. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وآله. Today we are uh, honored to have this session uh, honored on behalf of the Saudi Society of Clinical Chemistry and in collaboration with Al Burj Medical Diagnostic to have this seminar entitled Successful Strategies for Laboratory Accreditation. And today with me, we have two distinguished speakers. We have Dr. Ahmed Mustafa Awad, Consultant Pathologist, Laboratory Director in al Diagnostic, Abu Dhabi. And we have our great and esteemed uh, colleague, Dr. Leila Abdul Warith from the National Reference Laboratory and Chief Scientific Consultant, uh, and uh, Chief Scientific Officer, Abu Dhabi as well. Our two colleagues from the United Arab Emirates uh, in collaboration with the Saudi Society of Clinical Chemistry, uh, share uh, this passion of providing this uh, seminar, hoping to improve uh, the workplace and the standards of laboratory uh, in future. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker, Dr. Ahmed Awad. Dr. Ahmed Awad is a consultant pathologist. He obtained his uh, MBCHP in 2004 from the Faculty of Medicine, Alexandria uh, University, Egypt, followed by Master's in Chemical Pathology in 2010, a Diploma in Healthcare Quality in 2010, and his MD in Chemical Pathology in 2015. After then, he became very active in terms of research with public, many publications. And now he's leading uh, his lab uh, in the molecular testing department of Alberti Laboratory, with which he is accredited by the CAP uh, to test for SARS COVID 19 testing. The, term, the, the department also conducted HPV uh, PCR testing in house. He established the COVID 19 molecular testing laboratory with an initial capacity of 800 tests per day, which was eventually expanded to 3,500 tests uh, every 24 hour cycle. So this is very, very efficient and very impressive. Uh, he's been very active in terms of uh, education, uh, test validity, uh, with many, many, uh, many activities. Without further ado, he's going to present on establishing high quality through laboratory accreditation. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Ahmed, please. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zuhair. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, the honor is mine. I'm honored to, and delighted to be with you today. And uh, with uh, uh, the huge number of attendees, inshallah, it will be a, a, a good presentation. Thank you again for the invitation. And also, thank you to allow me to share the session with uh, my eminent professor, Dr. Laila. Um, and inshallah, during my presentation, uh, I wish it will be up to the standards and uh, everybody will get benefits from it inshallah so let's start the presentation okay it's uh, showing all right Dr. Ahmed. Okay. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start my presentation today is titled as Establishing High Quality in Lab Using Accreditation Standards. First of all, but just very a brief introduction about my laboratory. I'm, I'm the lab director of Alborj Medical Diagnostics in Abu Dhabi. Our lab chain is the biggest Gulf chain of laboratory. Uh, the, some fast facts about my laboratory is the largest test menu is more 1,600 plus more than 20 managed medical centers, more than 10 managed hospitals, with more than 10 analytical units. The state-of-the-art technologies that we have, cytogenetics, flow cytometry, pre-transplantation, and mass spectrometry, newborn screening, also histopathology and immunohistochemistry. Uh, our chain of laboratories had earned many, had many accreditation. Till 2019, this is the statistics that I have till 2019. Alhamdulillah, these numbers are increased now. 
but till 2019, there is eight CAB uh, accredited laboratories, 13 DCI accredited labs, five ISO 15189 accredited labs, and 34 Sibahi accredited labs. So as a brief introduction, uh, what is laboratory goals? Um, as we are a professional laboratory, medicine laboratory medicine is the single highest volume medical activity in healthcare, and the amount of laboratory testing is increasing disproportionately to the medical activity. But there's a challenge to the physicians, always the physician face many challenges in accurately, efficiently, and safely ordering and interpreting, interpreting the diagnostic test. So what the condition needs from us, they want quick, accurate, and inexpensive test, and also they need also sure new tests to be readily available. Simply, if you are going to discuss, or even if I ask any of you, what is the ultimate goal of our laboratories, some may share that will be the highest quality, the accuracy, as we said, the, the fast, the fast uh, results and, the, and like a, a good turnaround time. But we can summarize all of this, and I think any, all of you will agree with me that our ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of any laboratory operating under any accreditation standards in any, in any country will be the patient safety. And this will go with the uh, first role of, um, uh, of, uh, of the medicine generally, that to do no harm. So also we should offer our patients and our clinician service that achieve their patient safety. So by contrast, what will happen if there is no quality or are not following like a, a, a structured framework of quality and simply and what is the consequences of poor quality? If there is poor quality in our laboratory, uh, many things will happen that affect the, uh, the patient health, uh, inappropriate action in the form of over investigation or over treatment or even mistreatment and also inappropriate inaction in the form of lack of investigation and no treatment and don't forget also that the delayed action, and even if you are going to offer like accurate and reliable results, but this result is delayed and not released on its specified or predetermined time, this delayed action is a consequence also of poor quality and may affect your patient and may harm your patient. And sure, sure, loss of credibility of your laboratory and some legal actions also may happen or may occur to your laboratory. This is some statistics for medical errors. And also not to underestimate our role uh, as a uh, as a very important aspect or a very uh, important division uh, in the um, in the medicine in general. That if we see this number, for example, like six six to seventeen percent of the estimated percentage of all hospital adverse events occur due to diagnostic errors. Also, let's agree about another fact that mistakes always happen. Don't be embarrassed of your mistakes or the mistakes that, or don't hide your mistakes, you should admit your mistakes and also you should work to continually improve and to prevent and to correct these mistakes. For example, these are statistics from the Q-Track program. This Q-Track program, the uh, CAB accredited laboratory in US, uh, it's optional by the way, not all CAB accredited laboratory uh, mandated to, to participate in this program, but some of the labs, it's like, because it's, I think it's also like, not it's, uh, it's, it's paid, not a free charge, so let's, if we see, this is the percentage of the mistakes of the errors or the deviations in certain standards. Uh, the most critical or the most sensitive of them, this one test correction rate. For the test correction rate, for example, even the lowest percentage, in the, if we look at the 10th percentile, which is the lowest, lowest percentage here, uh, for this CAP accredited laboratory, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 in 2012, there is 0 0.7 report, amended or corrected report, every 10,000 report, which is really a, a, a big number. Um, imagine, ba, let's imagine if this laboratory, for example, not following any accreditation standard or not seeking for the quality, what will be the number and what will be the harm that may affect our patients? So when selecting a laboratory, any patients, if you are like a, as a customer, if you are like now seeking for uh, our family or our friends, will seek for certain tests in certain lab or the clinician will uh, need to choose a lab to refer his patients to. So the, we should guarantee the technical competence, which depends on number of factors. Factor number one of them, the staff, don't forget always the role of the staff and the importance to train and uh, assure the competence if you're a staff. And this staff sure should use the right equipment, the high quality equipment, 
and uh, follow adequate quality, quality assurance procedures and proper sampling practice, appropriate testing procedure using valid test method, which is traceable of, uh, to uh, national standard. Ensure the accurate recording and reporting procedure are important, and all of this should uh, occur on happen in suitable testing facility. So, what does quality mean? There is many definitions for quality, many, many definitions for quality. Uh, like the quality pioneer defined the quality like meeting the customer needs, uh, fitness for use, on cough or conformance of required for conformance to requirement. If we are talking about the standards point of view to the, the most uh, ne the nearest definition of quality here will be the conformance to requirement. But if we are talking about our ultimate goal and the, uh, and the, the why we are existing, even why or what is the role of uh, our lab in the health and in, in the medical yani, in the medical activity to be the meeting the, uh, the, our customer needs, either the internal customer or the external customer, which are patients again, again, by uh, uh, offering them reliable and accurate and timely test results. So now we have uh, two big terms was accreditation and certification. Sure, all of us know that they are, these two terms are not interchangeable. There is difference in certification and accreditation. Simply accreditation is more wider and even more practical to certify someone or to, first, to certify something. All what we need to do just to examine the procedures, examine the policies, examine the documents, or simply examine the quality management system, which is uh, prohibited by the QMS. But in the accreditation, we'll not only examine this, but also we will make sure that there's competency and there's continuous competency and compliance to achieve this QMS. So what is QMS? Quality management system are a structured framework for ensuring this consistency in the quality of product and service. The quality management principles are basic principle of quality. Most of the accrediting body and most of the accreditation standards are like after this uh, quality management principles. They are very famous, eight quality management principles, which are customer focus, leadership involvement, involvement of all people, process approach and system approach to management, we'll talk about this later, and continual improvement in each accrediting body or any accrediting standards, the continual improvement are very important pillar and very important factor. Also the factual approach to decision making, which is about the, the quality of data and reliability of collecting the data and uh, archiving and uh, recording of this data so we can analyze this data later to take factual decisions uh, and also the mutual beneficial supply, re supply relationship, which is like a feedback. You should take feedback of your customers in the form of uh, surveys and customer satisfaction uh, surveys to make sure that your service meeting the standards. So simply, what is the process approach? Again, let's see, I revise the uh, total, our te total testing process. Sure, all of us know, and let's remind ourselves that the total testing process is consisting of before, it was only three phases, which like pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical phase. And now it's like it's, uh, itemized in five phases, which is pre-pre-analytical, then pre-analytical, analytical, post-analytical, post and lastly, the post-post-analytical phase. Each phase of this, like a system, this system is consisted of multiple processes and multiple processes. Any process of them, there's inputs after certain processes, processes, it will give us output. So to take care of our inputs and make sure that these inputs are like uh, with, with good inputs with very, very high quality, and also to make standardized procedures or process, processing, uh, uh, which is transformation process here, will give you good output. Input number one, in process number one will give output number one. This output number one will be the input of the second process and so on till you end your uh, first phase. So the first phase will give you the outputs, which will be the uh, inputs of second phase. Lastly, till you reach the, to the last stage here or last phase here. So if you are assured the quality of your inputs and also the standardization of your procedures will give you good output till you reach the uh, last output in our service, which is the, the lab report. So again, the lab report, we are reminding ourselves the lab report it should be informative, should be accurate, should be reliable. And so also don't forget that it should be timely to achieve, uh, or to meet the standards and not to harm your patients and give the patients and the clinician the best service here. Uh, also not to forget, sure, by contrast, all of us need to know 
uh, the the famous uh, famous like uh, slogan or famous lore role from our colleagues in IT, which is, uh, uh, is uh, abbreviated like Gigo, which is garbage in garbage out. Sure, sure. In our uh, examples here, we're not. Uh, we are talking about good inputs in will give us good output out. So also the inputs, not to forget them. The inputs always like inputs any the inputs of any process. Uh, uh, will be uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, inputs and they abbreviate all of them in M's, which are either materials, manpower, methods, machines, measurement, maintenance and management. And also not to forget, as we mentioned in the, uh, before in the slides before, the, the facility, the facility or the environment that you are working in, even the environment, we can, can be abbreviated in M, which called by some like mother nature. So all of these inputs, we should take care of them, make sure that they are with, uh, they are with high, uh, very high qualities to make sure that we'll have very high quality also output. At the end, we'll have uh, our, uh, we'll achieve our ultimate goal, which is patient safety as, as a reminder, Yanni, as we mentioned in the first slide. Again, some rules, we cannot, you cannot manage what you don't measure. Um, it's not just about analysis, it's about the quality of the analysis and patient safety. Even if the quality cost, not to forget that the patient safety always comes first. The key component of quality management system, this key component are the management responsibility, resource management, examination process, and evaluation and continuing improvement will come for this in later slide, inshallah. So how to establish a quality management system? First of all, define your core and support processes and their interaction, and then create the documents, including the quality manual that should serve as an index to the necessary procedures, instructions, and the forms. And lastly, putting in place a system for control of these documents and reports. How then can you be sure that a laboratory is technically competent? Simply, if any one of your colleagues, your father, your mother, or you know, if your family asking you, um, this laboratory is good or this better, shall I go for this one for my analysis or not? Simply, you can give him one simple advice, just choose an accredited laboratory how our the lay people here or like the non-professional or non-specialized uh, people will go uh, know that this lab is accredited or not simply any accredited lab usually issue like uh, some type of symbol like the symbol of iso or the gci or the cabin the report itself or the patient or the clinician can ask you should also check with the laboratory as what a specific test because oh this is very important some accreditation standard like the iso we are talking now about the iso is giving is allowing the lab to choose a certain like unit of the lab or center scope of the lab to be accredited and others not accredited so or not ask any at that at that uh, uh, for this particular type of accreditation will not only ask the uh, about the accreditation status will also will, you'll also ask about the accreditation status in which scope of the laboratory but for some accrediting body, uh, some other accrediting body like the CAF, for example, or the ZCI, or even Sibahi in Saudi Arabia, is mandating that the whole scope of the lab to be accredited. Okay. Also, one of the uh, uh, tools that we can check the accreditation status, some accrediting body in some countries, they have like website, they publish the list of laboratory that they have accredited together with the laboratory contact details and information on their testing capabilities. Okay, so we are talking about the accreditation. What is the advantage to be accredited? To be accredited lab, it will improve the patient safety and minimize the risk of near misses. Also, this recognition of your testing competency, its market advantage, a benchmark of performance, also as pillar of quality or like a core uh, principle of any accreditation, it gives you a chance of, for continual improvement, its performance improvement effort. Accreditation is based on the concept of regular, proactive, and comprehensive performance improvement. Accreditation provides credibility and external validation of organization, enhance community confidence in the quality and safety of care provided. Why to be accredited? To increase the efficiency and enhance the lean practice, to satisfy your greater sure, reinforcement by insurers and other third parties. Accreditation provides a great learning and educational opportunity. Accreditation roadmap, almost it's like tally or like a, a common or similar uh, between different accreditation. First of all, choose the standards. Yes, you have the flexibility or how you are free to choose your standard, except if it's mandated by your country. And for example, in USA, the, the, it's mandated by the CLIA, all the laboratory uh, uh, working, non-research uh, uh, non lab laboratory working, uh, operating in USA should be CAP accredited. 
some other countries, uh, for example, mandate like for any uh, mandate certain uh, accreditation standard. If it's not mandated, like Sibahi, for example, in Saudi Arabia, it's not your choice uh, not to be Sibahi accredited. All laboratories working on operating in Saudi Arabia, either governmental or private, have to be Sibahi accredited. If it's not mandatory, so you can choose your standard. After choosing the standard, check the eligibility criteria and then purchase the standard itself. After purchasing the standard, you should do some exercise to purchase educational sources and guidelines, simply the references or like uh, 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 guidelines that you are going to follow to achieve this standard. By the way, sometimes it's free for charge. And inshallah, if there is time, I share with you some uh, resources which is free for charge, very repeatable, and any, anyone can uh, check to, uh, uh, to help in his uh, accreditation map. Uh, do gap analysis for your laboratory and then prepare the documents, training for the staff, make internal assessment, internal assessment either by mock survey or like consultant survey or even your by self assessment. After this assessment, you can ask for the accreditation uh, visit. After accreditation visit, sure, there is some citation or some deficiencies, so you will work on them by doing some corrective action and then you receive your accreditation decision, either you uh, deserve to award the accreditation or not. After accreditation is not the end, sure you should or you have to maintain your accreditation. And also there is by some accrediting body like CAF, for example, this ongoing assessment by uh, reporting the PT uh, uh, performance or PT reports. The proficiency testing, I mean, by this proficiency testing reports, the CAP, the CAP are uh, continually assessing your laboratory. And if there is any deviation or any deficiency, they can come to your laboratory by, by like on-site visit, even if it's not uh, 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 planned uh, just to check that uh, something is going wrong in your lab. Again, it's another definition of quality. Myself, personally, I, I, I like uh, um, uh, believe in this one more, which is like, say what you do, do what you say, and then prove it and improve it. I like what is I like. I like is international recognition for laboratory. Over 90 accreditation bodies have signed this multilateral recognition agreement called ILAC arrangement, uh, which greatly enhances the acceptance of data across the national border of signatory countries. For example, in Arab countries, the Arab Accreditation Cooperation signed this MRA, and under this ARAC, like many accreditation body uh, in each country, for example, here in UAE, we have IAC, in Egypt is IJAC, in Jordan, Jordanian Accreditation Symbol, and GCC, GCC Accredita Accreditation Center. Well, how widespread is ISO 15189? The ISO is a network of the national standard institutes um, of 162 countries, one member organization per country. ISO 15189 is internationally recognized standard with accreditation uh, organization offering ISO 15189 in over 50 countries. Define the competence required for a laboratory. This is for the ISO define the competence required for the laboratory director. Focus on patient outcome without downgrading the need for accuracy of measurement. In some countries, it's standard by which the laboratory is reimbursed, which is very, very important now. We, I think we discussed this in the advantage of the accreditation. If your laboratory is not accredited, for example, you cannot reimburse and you cannot, for example, like uh, increase your business or market share. Uh, because at that time, the uh, at that time the insurance, at that time the insurance uh, will not pay. The insurance company will not pay for you. Again, this is uh, this is uh, actually this is a very big defect for the ISO because you can have either all your scope of lab to be accredited by the ISO, or you can choose either, as we mentioned before, one unit or even some test in this unit to be accredited. The accreditation process involves a thorough evaluation of all elements of the laboratories that contribute to the production of accurate and reliable test data. The assessment criteria are based on the international ISO standard. At the end of the assessment, a detailed report on the evaluation is presented to the, is presented to the laboratory, highlighting any areas that require attention and corrective action prior to the laboratory being recommended for accreditation. Once accredited, the laboratory is re-evaluated periodically uh, every two years and its continued compliance with requirement and to check that the standard of operation is being maintained. The ISO is not covering the BCT point of care testing, also not covering the blood bank, and there is no ongoing assessment. 
ISO 50089 is mandated in some countries, as we mentioned in UAE, for example. And also in UAE, there is more and above, like for example, in Dubai, the DHA release uh, uh, complementary standard for the ISO. All the, the operating labs in Dubai should follow the ISO plus the DHA uh, clinical uh, standards, which are 49 standard plus four appendices. In uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, even if the lab is ISO accredited, he sh the, the laboratory operating in Abu Dhabi should follow the HAD regulation and in HAD regulations uh, covering all the aspects of uh, of lab. And also, even the blood bank, which is not covered in the in the uh, ISO, is covered in the had 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 standards by more than thirty standards. Okay, so we have done with the ISO now. Let's talk about the CAB. In CAB, the Congress in 1988 released this clear uh, clinical laboratory improvement amendments. Uh, it's mandatory that all laboratory laboratories uh, operating in USA should follow this clear act. Inspections carried out either by the government itself or by some organization that the government gives them the authority to make the inspection, like CAP, for example, College of American Pathologists. CAP sets its own standards over and above the requirement of CLIA and has recently uh, been offering an inspection that additionally involves the requirement of not only the CLIA but also the ISO 15189. Governments can mandate minimum standards. We discussed it before for medical laboratory testing. The two standards most widely used, either ISO or CAP. The standard setting body, this is very, very important rule. Let's see, I need, uh, remember it and we'll uh, discuss it later. The, the setting body here, for example, ISO is the, the, the body that setting the standards of the government in USA should be away or separate uh, uh, at arm length from the bodies that doing the inspection, which is CAP, for example, or EAC or EJAC, as we mentioned in the ISO. Okay, we we'll discussed this also before. The CAP Laboratory Accreditation Program is an internationally recognized laboratory inspection program. It's just laboratory inspection. They are not setting the rules. The only one of its kind utilizing multidisciplinary team of practicing laboratory professionals. The program is based on the requirement, this requirement and included in the something called uh, checklist which are used both by the laboratory to prepare for the inspection and also by the inspector during doing the inspection. So let's summarize what is the points peculiar or uh, distinguishing the CAB. The CAB is very harmonized tool of accreditation. Assessors have the same training guide using the same checklist, unified inspection methodology for each checklist, which either read specific documents and ask specific questions and observe or discover certain findings. PT performance purpose, which with each inspector, the inspector come to your laboratory with the BT performance report uh, to check the repeated and accepted BT. So same points to be considered like the self-assessment that you, uh, the lab itself uh, did uh, for the, the lab team, Yanni did for them, for themselves and the citation uh, investigation. Same way of grading the deficiency, standardized response to the deficiency, and fixing timing to order the booty, as we'll mention later in the in the example that we some of the requirement or the in the general uh, all common checklist, which is the proficiency testing, the laboratory performing outside the US, all of them, all of them are mandated to purchase and to be enrolled in the CAB proficiency material. So it's same provider of the BT and same evaluation criteria of BT. This ongoing assessment, the ongoing assessment through the BT performance itself. Yani, that means that the CAB always checking and uh, observing and evaluating the lab through the performance report of the BT. And as we mentioned before, if there is any deviation, any deficiency, any trend even, they can come and they can uh, send you like a, uh, like a notice or alarm what is going on in your lab. Even they can mandate for on-site inspection to check what is going on. Unaccepted BT may, may mandate on-site inspection, or even they can mandate you to see the test. A very specialized and detailed details for all aspects of lab medicine, and at the same time, not redundant. Customized according to each lab scope of service. CAB, again, just a reminder, CAB is not setting the standard. It's only a creating body or like an inspection body. This is an example, for example, one of the requirements, which is like proficiency testing, as we mentioned many times here. It's uh, included in the CAB or common checklist. Um, it's uh, uh, we discussed or we discussed already the point that all the laboratory out uh, per performing or operating outside the U.S. should be enrolled in the proficiency testing uh, uh, and purchase it from the CAB itself. Uh, and even in the requirement, they are sharing the evidence of compliance and some references for each requirement. 
cap accreditation, as we mentioned, it's like done by up to 18 checklists, like all common checklists, general checklist, chemistry checklist, hem uh, hematology checklist, immunology, microbiology, and director assessment checklist. And also there's a checklist for the pocket, preventive care testing and transfusion. And if the laboratory is your like with like limited scope or small size laboratory, you can have like customized or tailored checklist for your lab which will be consisted of general or common with the limited service laboratory checklist. This is the CAP accreditation cycle. It's like seven steps, starting with the laboratory receives the CAP application material, then on-site inspection. After the on-site inspection, inspection results are reported to the CAP. The laboratory respond to this finding or citation or deficiencies uh, from the on-site inspection. The CAP commissioner reviews the results and then the decision will be taken. The laboratory is awarded and receives the certificate and for accreditation. And lastly, the laboratory receive self-inspection material. We have done now with the ISO and with the CAB. Let's talk about Sebahi. Sebahi is the Saudi Central Board of Accreditation uh, for Accreditation of Healthcare Institute. It's the official agency authorized to grant accreditation certificates to all governmental and private health care facility operating today in Saudi Arabia. Sebahi has emerged from the Saudi Health Council as a non-profit organization. It's mandatory for all public and private health care delivery facility, either hospital, polyclinic, blood banks, or medical laboratory in Saudi Arabia, to comply with the national standards set by Sebahi and obtain its accreditation through a survey process forced by the center. It's uh, Sebahi standard are ISQA accredited, set the standard and do the accreditation. By the way, again, it is against the rule that we uh, uh, that applied in ISO and applied also in the CAP because Sebahi here, it's the, the body who set the standards and do the accreditation. Ongoing monitoring here, uh, we discussed in CAB, it's ongoing monitor by the by the BT performance report itself. Here, the here the ongoing monitoring by the KPI, by sharing the KPI. Uh, it's more than 120 standards covering all lab, all lab aspects. Each standard explained, it's very self-explained, and even the survey tools shared uh, and specified was also suggested reference. It's covering also the transfusion and anatomic pathology. This is an example, for example, uh, for one of the requirements which is uh, corrected and amended reports. It's uh, very detailed and explained. And even the survey tools shared. Um, simply, yani, this, uh, uh, yani, uh, that's how the, uh, the requirement to be, uh, to be shared and to be presented to the labs to avoid any ambiguity and also to share like a, to, to all the either the laboratory, all the laboratory uh, or the surveyors will have the common uh, ground without any uh, conflict, without any confusion uh, for each requirement. Again, for the Sebahi, they need piece of assessment, assessment for Sebahi every three years. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, ISO the assessment every two years and the CAB also every uh, two, uh, sorry, ISO every one year, every year, sorry, it's yearly. And the CAB, it's every two years at between the uh, inspection, the self-inspection, but for the Sebahi, it's every three years. Um, maintenance through mid-cycle self-assessment and reporting of any sentinel events. And also they are, sometimes they are doing like unannounced random surveys. They have like a methodology in the Sebahi, like 5% sample of all accredited facility randomly selected each year for this activity. Now, let's we'll talk about the GCI. GCI or Joint Commission, Joint Commission International, more than 1,000 accredited organizations in more than 100 countries are GCI accredited. They are very famous by this, their symbol of accreditation, which is the gold seal of approval in quality and patient safety. Um, bucket here also included, blood bank included, and patient safety goal related. It's like uh, uh, the core or the base of the CBA is as GCI is the patient safety, international patient safety goals. It's very objective scoring guidelines, like either you are met or partially met or unmet with even compliance rate. Uh, they are appreciating or considering a lot the voice of customer and also the culture of safety. It's very, very important in Sibahi. Um, this mock survey. Oh, this is also, this is very important because there is like a misconcept that the GCI only for hospital, GCI for hospital, and also for the laboratory in the hospital, it's easy and it's practical if the, the hospital is GCI accredited. So the laboratory also supposed, yeah, and supposed practically speaking to go for the GCI accreditation, but also, but also uh, the referral standalone lab, lab can go for the GCI accreditation. 
and USA, by the way, there is like a cooperation or like collaboration between GCI and CAP. So in the US, in the, if if the uh, CAP, if the lab is CAP accredited, for example, if the hospital uh, laboratory is CAP accredited, it can be also uh, gain the GCI accreditation. It's ISQA accredited. Uh, what is the eligibility criteria for the GCI? The laboratory is located outside the US. It's required by law that the laboratory has a facility license. All current service identified by organization in the survey, its uh, uh, application are in full operation at the time of inside application survey. The laboratory assume or is willing to assume responsibility for improving the quality of its care and service. And again, the GCI core, the GCR heart here is the international patient safety goals. Uh, again, we mentioned this before that the factual approach of decision making, this is very important, very, very important quality management principle to have effective how to, to be able to take effective decisions is based on the analysis of data. The quality management is culture that is data rich and based on facts, uh, measures and the quality indicator indicator on the critical step in your process, figures or errors on the process of uh, in the process or outcome, how to use the KPI. Why, sorry, why to use the KPI to understand how the process actually work, examining if they can meet the customer needs, monitoring ongoing performance, and to identify improvement opportunities. Some example for the KPI, this is only the customer KPI. For example, our external customer, again, which is the patient or the clinician, uh, to comply with the customer defined requirement, for example, percentage of emergency department potassium results within 45 minutes from arrival to the laboratory. This is our KPI. Percentage of oncology hemoglobin results within 30 minutes from arrival in laboratory. Number of early discharge patients with blood not collected before 9 a.m. Uh, also, the customer satisfaction is a very important KPI and market share analysis. Also, some KPIs for the internal customer, like internal training session delivered, staff attendance of meeting and conference, and staff satisfaction. Again, you cannot manage what you don't measure. It's not just about analysis, it's about the quality of analysis and patient safety and the quality cost, yet patient safety comes first. Accreditation and above. Accreditation is not the end, as all of us like uh, realize and believe in this. Accreditation, although some laboratories are meeting accreditation standards as an end itself, such laboratories will lose the benefit, which is the culture, which is continual improvement. Culture of organization-wide customer focus and systemic continuous improvement that comes from the use of the quality management system to drive overall quality rather than being merely a tool of achieving the minimal acceptance standards. How to apply the standards? Uh, as we mentioned, you can purchase the standards, for example, you can participate and be a member of the CLSI and purchase the standards from the CLSI. So by these standards or courses or the guidelines, you can achieve uh, the standards of CAB, the standards of the ISO. Um, Unfortunately, this is uh, it's very uh, very prestigious and one of the very famous guidelines, but it's uh, maybe a little bit expensive or we should pay for it. But there is some free for charge like the National Pathology Accreditation Advisory Council. This is from the Department of Health in Australia, uh, developed and published various standards and resources, which are free for charge. By the way, this is some example for these standards. And you can Google, by the way, you can Google them and you can download them from the National uh, NPACC. And also there is other prestigious organizations which called Association of Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine. Also, they are providing guidelines like lab, how to write a lab comment and the minimal retesting interval for the utilization management, for example, all of them. And also sort of sure the verification source like the, the uh, how to verify the accuracy, how to verify the precision, uh, uncertainty, linearity in your lab with its spreadsheet even and uh, to calculate the accuracy or the precision, and all of them are free of charge. I'm done. Take home messages. Again, I'm just repeating all over the presentation. Patient safety comes first. First, to err is human. Leave in the quality. Create patient-centered culture. Accreditation is a tool and not a target. And it's all about KPIs. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent overview. Uh, and I think this is a good uh, layout for the second presentation. We're going to have actually a Q&A session at the end of the second lecture. So I think we can, uh, we can, we can start the second lecture. Uh, so we have our very dear uh, Professor Dr. Layla Abdelbarth. She's a very 
uh, dear friend to the Saudi Society for Clinical Chemistry, uh, Dr. Leila uh, Abdelwarith, actually, uh, she is also uh, currently deputy executive director at the National Reference Laboratory and chair of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Institute at Cleveland Clinical Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Abdelwarith is a board certified uh, from the UAE National Pathology and, uh, Phys uh, and Physician Executive uh, with special interest in capacity building, quality assurance, and healthcare administration. She's a graduate from the Faculty of Medicine uh, in Ayn Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. She completed her postgraduate training at the University of British Columbia, Canada, and obtained the Canadian and American Board in Medical Biochemistry and Clinical Pathology, respectively. She's also obtained a master's degree in healthcare administration uh, from Zayed University, uh, United Arab Emirates. Very uh, heavy uh, credentials, and this is going to be uh, 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 gonna, gonna, gonna give her like a, a, a good start or get good continue of our uh, previous presentation. She's gonna speak about essential elements required for successful accreditation. Without further ado, please, Dr. Leila. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahir, for your uh, kind introduction. And I really like to thank you and thank the Saudi Society for Clinical Chemistry uh, for, you know, for their activities in general. You, you are a very active and productive society, truly. And I'm very honored uh, to be invited today uh, by your respective society and to be sharing with you uh, this uh, seminar, which is very dear uh, to my heart as well. Uh, in by the way, Dr. Uh, as of now, there's more than 1,500 participants. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, the passion is shared among those 1,500 participants as well. I also like to thank Dr. Ahmed for excellent presentation. He paves the way very nicely uh, now for, uh, for my presentation. I um, have nothing to disclose, then. These are uh, just the three objectives of uh, what I will be discussing today. So um, I'll list the hurdles uh, and the success factors for accreditation. So I'll talk more about the soft skills required, really, to push the program forward, if, if you if you like to achieve that. Uh, and what would be an effective strategy uh, to do so. Um, I'll try to shed a light on our own experience actually at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi um, and, and talk to you about what strategies that worked for us. So maybe, um, uh, you know, it could be uh, interesting for you and maybe you can uh, adopt some of these strategies as well. And then I will touch about the differences and similarities. I think Dr. Ahmed did a great job uh, covering all various international accreditation systems, uh, really. So I'm not going to dwell much on that, but I'll just touch very briefly uh, on the differences, the main differences between the CAP and, and the ISO and how they can be synergistic, really. Um, this is our picture a few days ago, literally. Uh, we had just finished uh, re-accreditation by the College of American Pathologists, by the American Association of Blood Banks, ISO 15189, and ISO 22870, uh, which is the ISO specific for point of care testing. So it was a humongous <laughs> accreditation feast, I call it. Uh, you can see very proud faces, although they're all masked, but uh, very proud faces uh, with this accomplishment. Um, so now I'd like to just ask a question uh, for the participants, please. And I'm just gonna go to the poll here to see. So are you currently working in an accredited lab? Please go to the poll and answer whether you are or not. I'm just going to go here to the poll and see your answers as they are. starting the poll now okay so please if you can answer okay if 
Fantastic. So um, really uh, more than 50% uh, are accredited, which is great. And about 43% are preparing, which is also great. So uh, this is the reason we're here. So um, to help those 43% to um, get to the uh, to the hundred percent, inshallah. So um, now, if we go to the second question, let's see. Um, so, if you are accredited, for those who answered yes, the fifty-six percent who answered this yes, what sort of accreditation uh, do you hold? Uh, is it uh, CAP, the College of American Pathologists? Is it ISO one? Oh, wow, one five eight nine both or other, like the Sibahi I'm hearing uh, is a very, uh, very strong accreditation body also in Saudi Arabia. All right. Oh, this is a very nice distribution here. Um, that's very nice. So we have um, we have the majority actually by CAP uh, and some both ISO as well as CAP, which is great. Uh, okay, and some others, and I suppose these are the Sibahi uh, perhaps accreditation. Um, so excellent. We have a very uh, interesting group, really. Okay, so we go back then. Thank you for participation. All right, so why accreditation in pathology and lab medicine? Well, Dr. Ahmed obviously covered this very, very elegantly. Uh, i just like to highlight that the Institute of Medicine uh, actually published in the National Academics of Science and Engineering and Medicine in 2015, a whole uh, publication just dedicated to improving diagnosis in healthcare. And in, in this publication, they talked about the diagnostic process uh, and, and basically the outcome of that diagnostic process, which will result in a successful treatment uh, of the patient. Um, they also talked that the outcome of the diagnostic process could hopefully lead to accurate timely diagnosis, but it could also end up in diagnostic errors, unfortunately, or near misses. Both either positive or negative outcome, could really affect how the patient is treated, could really affect patient outcomes, system outcomes. What is very, very important really, and this was also emphasized with Dr. Ahmed, is we need to keep learning from these diagnostic errors, near misses, and, and accurately, timely improve them as the diagnostic cycle uh, progress. So, where are the failures in the diagnostic process of care? Where there are many areas where the failure uh, could actually occur, either failure of engagement, information gathering, integration, interpretation, failures to establish or explain uh, uh, the healthcare problem, failure to explain uh, and communicate uh, to the caregivers uh, of the patient. Now, this is the work system in any laboratory. You have your diagnostic team members, your, your, your staff, whether pathologists or technologists working in a lab. You have your tools, the equipment uh, that Dr. Ahmed talks about, uh, your information, the lab information system, for example. You have the organization, you have the tasks, which are the processes that govern, uh, you know, the, 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 the work that this uh, lab is, is producing. And then you have the physical environment and the external uh, environment. So the work system really is where you need to emphasize uh, so then you can prevent these diagnostics uh, error. So in the same publication, they came up with several recommendations on how to reduce failures and improve diagnosis. The first one is to enhance healthcare professional education and training, so the competencies in the diagnostic processes. And this is something that Dr. Ahmed also uh, emphasized. So the healthcare professionals have to have uh, adequate credentials and uh, competencies and have to be able to maintain 
those credentials and competencies. Now, the certification bodies and the accreditation organization should really make sure that this happens in the clinical labs. The other important goal that they have also uh, published is to develop and deploy programs to monitor the diagnostic process in order to identify, learn from, and reduce your errors. The third uh, recommendation is to establish a work system and culture that supports the diagnostic process and improve an improvement in the diagnostic performance. So uh, implementation of non-punitive culture, the just culture, uh, uh, and that could be a, a lecture by itself or a talk by itself. The effective communication between the diagnostic team and the treating team of the healthcare professionals and the design of the work system that supports patient uh, clinical needs. So if you think about this, all of this really can be achieved by having the accreditation pathology and laboratory medicine. It's such a great tool to get your house in order, uh, to really achieve all of these things that will lead ultimately to patient safety, better diagnostics, and reduction of diagnostic errors, and therefore improving healthcare outcomes. So if you think about it again, as Dr. Ahmed elegantly uh, explained to us, it not only takes the regulatory requirement, but it helps in standardizing your uh, operations. Uh, it gives you that extra layer of rigor uh, in error prevention, continuous improvement, process integration, customer focus, and the customer here really is, is the patient, but also your physician colleagues and um, the institution you're working for, and most importantly, also staff development. Um, so why CAP and, and why ISO? Uh, you know, in really CAP uh, or College of American Pathologists and ISO, and I, I suppose CBI as well, are really best peer review accreditation processes. So they have been tested and vetted over and over and over again. It provides a solid objective and an indicator of the high standard your laboratory will be holding when you achieve those accreditations. This is a very important message to our stakeholders, to the hospital administration, to your physicians, to uh, your colleagues in, in the hospital, to the patients, the community, uh, our clients, uh, accreditation licensing body, and our payers. And obviously to your own staff that are working with you in the lab. You're sending a very strong message to them that you're upholding the highest, uh, basically best diagnostic uh, uh, standards in, in your laboratory. So uh, talk, Dr. Ahmed talked elegantly about the uh, College of Record Accreditation uh, um, system. Uh, basically, you have the, the standards uh, for lab accreditation. There are uh, four standards, one for the lab director, one for the physical facility, uh, one for the quality control and uh, 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 proficiency testing, and then one for inspection uh, requirements. Um, they publish 18 checklist, customized checklist, um, and this all constitute the laboratory accreditation manual. Uh, the checklists are divided into what we call an all-common checklist, uh, which basically uh, focus on proficiency testing, and then the quality management uh, program that you have, as well as test validation, verification, and indiv individualized quality control plan. And then there is the specific, uh, uh, specialty-specific uh, checklist. So, for example, you have a clinical uh, chemistry and toxicology checklist, you have a blood bank uh, or transfusion medicine checklist, hematology checklist, and so on. And that looks at your quality management and QC that pertains to that particular section uh, in terms of your PT participation, your internal QC, and, and so on. It looks at your own methods and instruments that are used in that, again, particular system, whether there's in, you know, a flow cytometry lab or a molecular diagnostics lab, the personnel competencies and how you maintain them, the safety, and your activity menu. And as Dr. Ahmed uh, indicated, uh, it is really very uh, explicitly laid out. So you have the standard here. So this is for the therapeutic drug monitoring. So um, this is the number of the standard, and then this is how it reads. Where applicable, therapeutic drug monitoring results are reported in relation to patient dosing and or time, uh, timing uh, information. They explain to you the intent 
uh, of the standard, why the standard is there. And then they tell you what are the evidence of compliance. So what exactly the inspector will be looking for. The inspector will be looking for a written procedure defining criteria for reporting TDM results. And then they list for you a host of references uh, that you can use to help building this procedure that you like to put in place. So it's a very explicit system and really very easy to follow. And, and this is why I really like uh, using it. Now ISO 15189, which is the ISO standards for clinical labs, has its origin from both ISO uh, 901, which is the quality standards, as well as ISO 17025, which is the competence standard. So as you can see, quality and competence combined produce the ISO 15189. And as Dr. Ahmed indicated, you have management requirements. So there are about 15 uh, requirements uh, in there. And then there are technical requirements. And these will be um, for all your technical uh, procedures, basically, in the laboratory that are appropriate to your scope of testing. And this is, as Dr. Ahmed uh, elegantly explained as well, the quality management principles that are engraved in the ISO 901, um, basically that starts with inputs from our patients and customers, and then an output at the end which guaranteed satisfaction. But in, in the middle of that, for that product um, uh, realization, you have lots of processes that govern uh, this particular output. And it is the management responsibilities to have the adequate resources to put these processes in, in, in place and to have a continuous way of measuring and analyzing the output and improving it. So what are the hurdles and what are the success factors? Uh, the first important hurdle, if you are preparing to achieve accreditation in your lab, is the resource hurdle you have to make sure that you have adequate resources. You have adequate staffing. Uh, you have teams working for you. You divide the tasks between those teams. You have to train the, the team on the, you know, whichever accreditation you like to go for. So the resource hurdle is an important one. The second one is the cognitive hurdle. You have to make sure that your team understands exactly the task that they are about to execute. So as Dr. Ahmed indicated uh, earlier, obtain your checklist, go over them, have quality forums, training and education like this one, for example, in order to overcome the cognitive hurdle. This is an important hurdle because many people get fixated that this is an impossible task. We can never obtain CAP or can never obtain ISO accreditation. It's so massive, it is so difficult and so on. But unless you bring them face-to-face -face with the standard, and unless you explain it to them and let them discover it themselves, that cognitive hurdle could actually be a very big one that you need to overcome. So um, I urge you to really address it, and the only way to address it is just to educate and share the standards with the staff. Political hurdle is an interesting one. You always have those who are uh, skeptics about it. I mean, why should we go for ISO? Why should we go for CAP? We're doing just fine. Our results are excellent. You know, why do we need to do that? Why the extra work? We're short staffed. Uh, this is not the time. Uh, there is COVID right now. <laughs> We're busy. Uh, there are always, uh, always issues um, that are going to come to you kind of pushing you back not to uh, uh, embark on this journey because we're just busy with everything else or because we're short uh, staffed or because there are a huge change coming up or whatever. So you really have to address this. Uh, you really need to talk to the skeptics. Uh, you need to get the support of your team. Uh, you need to sometimes use what we call the yin yang, um, uh, you know, tactics. Sometimes you may need to push hard. And if you feel the team is really stressed out and it is truly really stressful time, you take it back a little bit. You, you kind of relax a little bit and allow them a little breather to, um, kind of recover. Uh, but you need to kind of keep the uh, pressure and try to overcome this political hurdle. 
The fourth and very important one to uh, also have is the motivational hurdle. So how you motivate, how you how you make uh, your your staff happy and engaged and uh, completely consumed in this process. And I have to say, it is really very heartwarming when when you see this happening. So make sure that you celebrate small wins. Whatever small achievements you obtain, celebrate them. Uh, highlight the success of the of the team. Uh, internal audits are a very powerful uh, motivational tool. So get the hematology team to inspect the chemistry team or get the microbiology team to go over with the checklist to the anatomic pathology team and inspect them. Uh, it is very interesting when you when you start doing that. Empower the staff. Um, ask them for their uh, recommendations for the changes and acknowledge their contributions. Uh, implement action plans and follow up through a steering committee. Um, make sure that there is progress and that they are seeing this progress. Again, the peer review, maybe invite another hospital or another laboratory. So why don't we invite our colleagues uh, from Al Burj Lab to come and inspect us as a mock inspection, for example, uh, like what Dr. Ahmed uh, talked about before. These are all very powerful tools, by the way, um, to motivate your staff. And nothing more powerful than having them audited by their peers. Nothing more powerful than inviting that other team from another lab to come and look at your practice, to come and look at your documents, to come and look at your quality management program and see how far you've gone. That really is like a fire um, uh, that will create, you know, uh, competition and, and it really will drive the team to uh, achieve this mission. Um, I'll just uh, share with you probably uh, very quickly our experience uh, when we started this. Um, I will just share the most recent perhaps experience when we started this at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi when it was a startup uh, hospital in, uh, in 2015. Um, but this is not my first experience with accreditation. However, it's just uh, perhaps the latest uh, one that I, uh, I was in, involved in. And we published this actually uh, in Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in 2017 uh, with the title of Fast Track Accreditation because we had to implement uh, the CAP and the ISO uh, pretty much uh, you know, one after the other um, and how we went about it and how we did it in a startup uh, environment. So that was uh, an interesting one because the hospital was just really uh, starting up. So the challenges uh, and opportunities that uh, presented themselves to us is, as I mentioned, it was a startup operation. So uh, startup operation, you have your team focusing mostly on the operational issue. They want to start up the hospital. They want to start up the lab and they're busy with these things. They're not going to worry about accreditation. Yeah. So that's, so you have, uh, you know, a divided uh, uh, attention here because they're really consumed about the operational issue. You have a diverse workforce and uh, this is this is true in our part of the world where you have people coming with you know Australian uh, standards, uh, people working in Egypt, people working in India, uh, people coming from the UK, people coming from the USA, and and everybody is following different um, uh, standards and, uh, and and conformances and so on. Uh, document control is is a very big uh, challenge, and you really have to address this. And I will uh, share with you some of the tactics we we used. Method validation and the measurement of our of uncertainty, uh, if you are embarking on the ISO accreditation, is also an important uh, challenge that you have to tackle. Your safety program, uh, your laboratory information system, and how you went about validating that system. Uh, is a very important one. Your point of care testing program, if you're in a hospital setting and if you have a POCT program, your quality manual, the system of identification and control of non-conformances, your internal audit program, again, your quality management and quality culture, risk management, which is a very important one for ISO, and then finally, management review. Um, Document control perhaps has to be the first thing that you need to think about uh, when you're embarking on this journey, because all of a sudden you will see a lot of documents, a lot of policy procedures coming up. And unless you guys agree initially on how we're going to um, call this document, in what section, what number, and so on, 
you will find that you have a plethora of documents that you are unable to control. So it's a very important that you come up with a system how you're going to control these documents. You have to uh, discriminate between what a record is, what work instructions is, what is a policy, what is a procedure, and what is a manual. This is a very important foundation so then everybody knows what is the type of document that they are producing. Is it a form, temperature monitoring form? Or is it a work instruction? Or are you writing a policy on how to communicate critical results, for example? Um, initially, that was a very big challenge for us because it was a manual process. And we were saving documents on the Y drive and so on. And there was such a high influx, as I mentioned, of policies and procedures. Because as you are reading these standards, you are trying to conform by producing these policies and procedures that are gonna, that are gonna regulate this particular process. There will be multiple versions because, you know, one reads them and then you discover there is a new section that maybe you need to add it. So you will add it to the same procedure and so on. So um, inadequate control on these documents can be a challenge. Opportunities uh, is, you know, try to get an automated uh, system, uh, either, uh, you know, policy tech, QPulse. Uh, they really... Uh, that investment will pay off, trust me. And it's a, it's a great way to control your document. Easy access of information. You have a way that these documents are automatically, when they are due for updating, that it will assign the responsibility, it will alert the person uh, that needs to update them and so on. And uh, it's a very controlled way. Audits is, is another uh, uh, important aspect that you need to uh, address. Uh, if you are planning to go for ISO, um, you need to do three kinds of audits. One is called the horizontal audit, which um, looks across, uh, horizontally looks across, for example, one process, for example, your equipment across the entire laboratory, how you're caring for your equipment, equipment maintenance and uh, testing and so on. Uh, and then there is a vertical audit where you, for example, follow uh, a one test, uh, a coagul coagulation test, for example, and you just go from physician ordering, sample receiving, patient identification, sample processing in the lab, testing, internal QC, external proficiency testing, reporting, the competency of the staff doing the test, and so on. So it's just from A to Z, basically following the entire uh, process of, of one particular test or one particular uh, uh, activity. And then there is what we call a witness audit, where you actually go there and observe uh, somebody, you know, uh, performing a coagulation uh, PT or uh, APTT test on a machine, or doing a CBC, or, uh, or doing urine analysis. Um, so that's a witness audit. Uh, when we again embarked on this, uh, there was no formal process to conduct these audits. There was no standardized way. Um, and, and the team wasn't buying into this. Uh, so we found that this was a gap that we needed to address. We invested in training auditors, basically our lab staff. We uh, brought in uh, some training from ISO, from the College of American Pathologists. You know, you can do the uh, CAP online training. And then you can start uh, uh, training and certifying uh, your staff to become actually auditors. Uh, it is a process and they have to be trained to become auditors. Not everybody can come and start, you know, thinking that they can be an auditor and start auditing without doing those uh, training requirements first and getting the sign off that they are uh, approved to become auditors. Uh, identify those stars, formalize the process, make a schedule and so on, and start auditing uh, your laboratory, whether it's a vertical, horizontal, whichever, or if you're gonna use the CAP checklist, uh, start uh, using the CAP checklist, for example. Uh, we came, uh, stumbled across a very nice tool uh, published by the World Health Organization. Uh, it's called the SLIPTA tool. I will uh, explain that in a minute, which really helped us a great deal uh, preparing uh, for ISO. Um, so this is the SLIPTA tool, and, and SLIPTA stands for Stopwise Laboratory Quality Improvement Process Towards Accreditation. 
is available free of charge. As Dr. Ahmed indicated, there are many resources actually that you would have available to you free of charge if you are serious about pursuing this task. And, and this particular tool really is to help laboratories get ready for the ISO 15189 uh, accreditation. So if you're first time embarking on this, it's really a great way to, to use it because it has all the, the standards, you know, the documents and records, the management review, organizational personnel, and so on, all of them. Uh, and then you basically have a, a checklist. So this is for documents and records. And then you just go and and, and check, do you have this, yes or no? And as you do that, it gives you automatically a score. And it tells you, okay, uh, for example, your organization and personnel, you're 55% there. Uh, for the equipment, 36% there. Uh, the uh, information management, you're around 44% and so on. And it gives you also a score. So uh, basically, uh, you have one star if you uh, achieve 55 to 64 percent. So let me go back. Yeah, you actually get a score uh, at the end of doing that. So as you compile these uh, in, you will number at the end. And how is your progress? So, OK, you are at 55 percent. You do a few more and then you're at 74 percent. You do a little bit more and they are at 84% until you reach the 95% or five stars. At that time, you're ready to invite your ISO uh, inspectors in for inspection. Another way to do this as well, as uh, Dr. Ahmed indicated earlier, is to do a mock inspection, just do a mock ISO uh, inspection, uh, not the real one, and that will also help identifying the gaps and where you need to concentrate your effort. But I really love this tool. It, it was just amazing. And, um, and the team loved it as well because it just gives them some numerical value of, of where we stand. And then every meeting we come and look at it, okay, where we are now? Oh, okay, we're at 84%, for example, with this particular aspect or, or the other. Um, another important one is you have to, uh, have to have a good system for identification and control of non-conformances. So what is a non-conformance? Failure to comply with certain requirements, like this blue uh, chick here. So we're supposed to produce yellow chicks, yeah? That one is defective. <laughs> so there is a non-conformity here. Um, the non-conformities or non-conformance can come to you from different aspects. Uh, there is either your occurrences, if you have an occurrence management program, the quality improvement forms that you have, your internal audits. If you find something which is not conforming, so if you find uh, somebody who's not following a procedure or if you find that a policy is not there to govern certain process or whatever, this is also a non-conformance. You have to have a good way to monitor uh, and control uh, these non-conformances and learn from them, as, as we mentioned. Uh, continual Im improvements. Uh, again, in, invest in training your people about you know, the plan, do, check, act uh, cycle or the uh, Lean Six Sigma. Just a little bit of training in, in that mindset of what continual improvement mean and what, uh, what tools to use to think about uh, w when you have a problem or when you have an issue. Uh, that you want to improve in your laboratory. Management review is, is very important and you have to have a structured process. Again, this is if you're pursuing the ISO 15189. Uh, you have 15 inputs in, in that review that has to be there and you have to discuss three outputs after that deliberate and extensive uh, discussion about all those 15 inputs uh, that you have to uh, go over. And this has to happen once a year. So once a year, all the department sits and review all these uh, inputs, and at the end, they come up with three outputs that will, again, help fine-tune your quality management system, improve your services, and, and if there are any resources required, address those resources that are required. Project management is paramount. Uh, so change management, what we talked about, and then the project management is very, very important. So you have to have commitment, you have to have maybe a steering uh, committee, a team, uh, you need to lead the way, um, you need to hold your uh, colleagues uh, also responsible with you, and you need to make the goal very clear. We want to achieve 
XYZ accreditation by this month or this year or whatever. You guys need to meet regularly and always, always look at where you are with regards to the uh, to the goal and hold all of these people accountable. Each one has to have an action plan on how they're going to uh, achieve this. Um, so in summary, accreditation really, I hope uh, me and Dr. Ahmed convinced you now that it is the perfect means uh, towards building quality medical laboratories and improving patient safety. Uh, accreditation by CAB, by ISO, by CBAHI are among the most reputable and well-established systems in clinical labs. Both accreditation, uh, whether it's ISO and CAP, you know, it is nice to have them both because there are synergistic uh, features, and maybe we can discuss this further in, in the Q&A section. Um, there are key elements to success that involves uh, having a dedicated project management and change management, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, addressing all these hurdles, especially the motivational hurdles, the cognitive hurdle, the political hurdle, um, you really need to address those. And this is part of your change management. We are, as human beings, we are very resistant to change. Things are working fine. Why do you need us to do that? <laughs> Um, you will always get this message, uh, but in order to uh, get the message across, you need to be very tactful on, on how you're going to do that. And laboratory seeking accreditation uh, in early operation stages may face a number of challenges. Trust me, the first time you're going to embark on this journey, you are going to face tons of challenges, but you have to keep going. Don't let those challenges deter you or uh, prevent you from achieving your goals. So in closing, I like just to um, uh, capture the quote by uh, Winston Churchill. If you're going through hell, just keep going. Don't stay, don't stall, just continue, get out of it and uh, just do it. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Leila extremely very interesting and uh, uh, motivating lecture again if you just if you joined uh, lately on behalf of the Saudi study for clinical chemistry uh, president Dr. Simon Stupki and myself uh, Dr. Zahir Awan the secretary general of the Saudi study of clinical chemistry I would like to thank both the speakers uh, in this uh, evening event on uh, the title successful strategy for laboratory accreditation uh, in collaboration with uh, al -Burj Diagnostic. Uh, this is a method of uh, reaching out to our colleagues, and not in Saudi Arabia, but in the region, and in, to, in order to connect and share information and uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, we have a lot, plenty of time, I think, to both uh, speakers to uh, discuss many of the questions that have been coming through the Q&A. Uh, let me just start by First, before I start, I would like to thank the 1,600 participants that have joined us this evening. Uh, the first question um, for Dr. Leila. Uh, is the accreditation, how much that does accreditation cost and is it cost effective and what is the expected time to achieve uh, accreditation? Uh, so the costing uh, will vary according to the accreditation body you are seeking. Uh, now, ISO accreditation, for example, is, is, is not very costly at all. CAP could be a little bit costly, um, mostly because of the proficiency testing uh, programs uh, that you participate uh, for. Uh, I'm not sure about Sibahi, uh, Dr. Dr. Ahmed, or maybe the... Uh, is it free of charge, or do you also have... Uh, fees for it's, it's free it's generally free well wonderful i mean this is great so uh, you have a free <laughs> accreditation body in saudi arabia here which you know an opportunity so uh, go for it but yeah the cost will uh, differ it is certainly cost effective uh, I, i'm hoping you know again dr ahmed talks about the cost of poor quality Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and patient safety is, is paramount. And the interesting thing is once you lay the foundation, once you, you put the groundwork and you really go through that first cycle of accreditation, everything afterwards is just on autopilot. 
it's not that you need to do all of this again, all over again when you are re-accredited. It's just fine-tuning because you're always now in a kind of a continuous readiness uh, process. Um, and, and there are many, many publications to the uh, to the effect of, of how, you know, again, the cost of poor quality and how accreditation helps in preventing those. Thank you, Iksa. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, is there any benefit of having more than one accreditation, let's say CAP, ISO, uh, etc.? Is it, is, is it beneficial to actually uh, go for one more than one accreditation? Okay, this is a very good question. Um, uh, actually, it's uh, I'll I'll share my personal experience when I came here. I asked this question to myself because in Al Burj we uh, are ISO accredited and also we are CAB accredited. And lastly, we just passed the GCI surveillance, so inshallah, uh, recently will be GCI accredited. Uh, from the practical point of view, yes, uh, it's it's worthy and even even will even will pay a lot. For example, CAB cost a lot and ISO may cost for the surveillance, but it's more comprehensive. Any uh, some points, uh, yani, sure, sure. If theoretically speaking, all the aspects of quality and patient safety are covered in every single accreditation, but the surveyor itself and the survey method, sure, in the, uh, will not cover everything. It's uh, yani, for example, for example, in the in the uh, GCI, the uh, assessors was very after the patient safety goals, which is very crucial. I, le I learned a lot. I'm not like accusing that other accreditation missed this point, but it will be more and more comprehensive. As Dr. Laila even shared, the CAB and ISO are synergistic uh, and uh, comprehensive. If you are getting, if you are taking in the in the scale of quality, if you're uh, what's called, um, we are sure we are seeking for perfection, but no one perfect here. Mistakes always happen. But for example, if you reach it like 90%, let's make it in grades again. 90% uh, uh, excellent by two accreditation, maybe. 95%, but the accreditation will be more and more confidence. I think Yanni will reach like near 100%. This is from the practical point of view and the quality point of view. From the financial point of view, yes, also it may uh, it may worse to go for more than accreditation. Yanni, uh, Yanni here in UAE, for example, at uh, the insurance, the main insurance payer uh, uh, mandates that the lab to reimburse should be ISO accredited. So uh, if you are cap accredited for for sake of repetition and seek for the example to management decision and to gain more uh, uh, more business opportunity uh, for some for example companies or some what's so called in uh, terms of financial terms like corporate business for example that after the cap accreditation you have to be uh, uh, iso accredited and also as we shared in the for, for example if one lab operating our board branches in Saudi, for example, if they are CAB accredited and ISO accredited, they have also to be CBA accredited. So it's from the practical and the quality point of view and from the financial and regulation point of view, it works and sure there is more and more benefits to be more to be accredited by more than one accreditation. Hey, yeah, if I may also, Dr. Zahir, excellent, uh, Dr. Ahmed, if, if I may just again uh, to share our our experience as well. What we found is uh, when you go for uh, for CAP, for example, the technical requirements are very well uh, explicitly there. Uh, this is not true, for example, very much with ISO. So uh, what would the flow cytometry lab do? to conform? What would a microbiology lab do to conform? What would a cl clinical chemistry lab do to conform? Uh, ISO just have those technical requirements and whichever lab you are, you just have to conform with these requirements, but it doesn't tell you how. Uh, the CAP explicitly tell you how and show you the resources, the, the CLSI that Dr. Ahmed uh, talked about and so on. So it is really, it gives you, uh, I think, more strength in that technical requirements. Now, having said that, the management requirements is very strong in ISO. Uh, the risk management, the emphasis on non-conformances, the emphasis on audits, um, the emphasis on, on management review. Um, these are very, very strong, I have to say, in, in ISO. And you don't see that there is, um, I mean, of course, CAP covers them, but the emphasis, I think, in, in ISO and the structure there and the rigor is, is stronger. So you will find that these are kind of um, helping each other, if you like, or synergistic, uh, as mentioned. And as Dr. Ahmed uh, said, you know, as you embark on these, you almost reach basically 100%. You cover all your blind spots, basically. 
Excellent answer. Uh, Dr. Leila, uh, there's a question from Mazin. What is better to assign quality team and will be responsible for accreditation and preparation or to involve all uh, the staff and stakeholders? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mazin, for this question. It's an excellent question, actually. Uh, you need to have a quality manager. Uh, somebody needs to be managing, coordinating this entire uh, uh, endeavor or activity. Uh, and perhaps a quality team, maybe the manager needs a couple of members also to support, or at least one member to support as well. However, uh, the, 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 the team also need to own, the, in each section, in each department of the laboratory, needs to own these processes and need to be themselves invested in driving it. So the quality manager will help, will guide, will coordinate, will make sure that the train is on the, you know, it leaves the station on time, arrives on time all these documents are there they're organized and so on the quality management uh, structure is there all the elements are, are there but really the technical and clinical teams in each sections have to be have to own this and uh, both pathologists as well as technologists we're all in it together um, and not just dump this on the quality team excellent um, a question for dr ahmed uh, do you know of any accreditation for a research lab? I mean, we've been talking about clinical lab, but is which 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 accreditation you prefer for a research lab? Uh, there is an ISO an ISO standard for research laboratories, actually. Yeah, so it's an ISO it's an ISO standard. But I didn't hear that question. But thank you, Doctor Layla, for answering. <laughs> Dr. Ahmed, maybe this question you can address. What are the common issues that are, uh, you know, are, are repeated when uh, uh, that makes the lab fail the survey? Uh, fail the survey. Oh, okay. So, uh, as for, for example, we mentioned in the cap, uh, for example, the um, if there is a BT failure, uh, uh, if there is like a, a many failure or repetitive failure. For the uh, for the uh, uh, PT performance, um, for example, in the ISO, as uh, Dr. Laila even uh, listed in details, for example, if any of the standards or any of the clauses is not met at all, if, for example, there is no internal audit. Internal audit is a, a very important clause. For, for for example, if the lab is not performing internal audit at all, or there is no documents or no uh, uh, reference or no uh, no uh, evidence that this internal audit already uh, done for this lab. Uh, also, if there is no management review, management review is a very clear close. So, if there is no management review done at all, uh, uh, this also may lead to a failure. Um, for the uh, for the uh, for let's say if we take it from the technical competence, for example, for the personnel, uh, the personnel. Uh, the personal, the content of personal folder, for example, is no internal training plan. The training also is very important close. So if there's no internal plan, training plan, or no evidence that the staff already attended any training uh, or no continuous competency assessment for the staff. Uh, so this may lead to failure. That means that the lab itself is not aware about the requirement of the accreditation and not prepared. So sure, they lead to failure. From the GCI, from the GCI, also this is to prove for like a practical example that to Dr. Laila said, for example, uh, Dr. Laila said it clearly, what I need to clarify before that ISO after management and the CAB is after the technical requirement, even in details, uh, the GCI after patient safety. So they will very, very, uh, very strict regarding the culture of safety and uh, the voice of customer, despite of being uh, 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 in words, it's like it's very important, but uh, that's the surveyor go in details and um, and alhamdulillah yani, we were complying by way or another but uh, for example if you are not aware about the culture of safety and there is no safety culture policy or survey for uh, survey for example to um, like a customer satisfaction survey or stuff sorry staff satisfaction survey to make sure that they are uh, uh, um, practicing safety culture inside the organization i think this will lead may lead to fail for failure for us in the gci accreditation so simply, yani, if there is any of the requirements or any of the standards or any of the clauses as not addressed or not attended by the lab, this will lead a failure, lead to a failure. Dr. Layla, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, excellent points, uh, Dr. Ahmed. And I think, uh, you know, as Dr. Ahmed said, there are uh, basically minimal 
requirements that you have to have. And these minimal requirements to do with patient safety. So if the inspector came and find out something that will affect patient safety, for example, the staff are not competent, they're not licensed, uh, they're not trained, <laughs> they, they will walk away. However, um, if, if, you, if you meet the minimum requirements, the inspectors could come and they could find a list of findings, yeah? It doesn't fail you. Uh, you will always have the opportunity, so they will find things that you need to address, and you need to respond to them. You need to provide an action plan. You need to uh, provide evidence that you fix them. They don't fail you, but they allow you to submit these evidence to correct, uh, to correct this particular finding that they find, as long as it does not affect patient safety. Anything that to do or affects patient safety directly, you will not get the, the uh, accreditation. But any other things, trust me, you know, you can come up with, with you know, a 50 <laughs> findings from one inspection. Don't be discouraged. You can always sit down, address them, and submit them to either CAP or ISO, and then you will be granted the certification. So as long as you prepare yourself and you make sure that you meet the minimum requirements required for this particular accreditation, you should be fine. Great points. Uh, Razan asked a question uh, for CAV visit. Dr. Ahmed, maybe you can address this point. Uh, will we need to print a copy of the proficient result that were uploaded in the lab system? Um, I think no, this is maybe a difference also. I will make the CAB visits more practical than ISO. I practice this in the ISO. Um, honestly, in, in my previous lab in my home country, so we lost uh, a lot of time to print and to, for example, if the scope, uh, alhamdulillah, I mean, my scope before was like a huge scope. So me, me, me have a one day just to print and just to follow up. And honestly, Annie, they may miss some findings. In the cab, they already came, come to the to lab and the HR assessor have the uh, BT summary. And even this under, with underlying finding, for example, if there's like a, a repetitive unaccepted results or even trend, they come and they check this one because he, uh, he was aware uh, about this finding ahead. So no need to, to even we, we never ask it to print a, a BT performance summary for them. It's already shared ahead. Yes. Dr. Layla, uh, Muhammad Radwan is asking what what quality manual means or contain? Mm -hmm. Excellent question, Mr. Radwan. So quality manual basically is a description of, of how you go about quality management in your, in your laboratory. And uh, if you are going to prepare this quality manual for the ISO, uh, uh, inspection or accreditation, you really uh, need to uh, talk about how you are addressing each of these. Remember, I said there are technical requirements and there are management requirements. You need to talk about how in your laboratory, you're, you're, to, you're addressing uh, staff competence, how you're addressing equipment management, how you're addressing non-conformances, how you're addressing uh, uh, continual improvement and so on. So the quality manual basically puts together how you your lab is operating in a nutshell. Now, it doesn't have to have all the details because you can say, you know, for continual improvement, please refer to the continuous improvement policy procedure. For risk management, I have this policy and procedures that talks about risk management. For competency assessment, this is how. But it gives the uh, the any individual who comes to your lab, whether it is, a, for example, a new technical staff or a new pathologist working in your lab, read the quality manual. It tells you all about what happens in this lab with regards to how we, how we go about our business, basically, whether it's technical or, uh, uh, or administrative, basically, or quality management. I hope I Great. answered the question. Great answer. Very clear. Um, Again, Mohamed Rouhan asked a question, where to find good and clear practical guides for implementation of standards? I think you have mentioned a few. Uh, however, is there a, a link or is there a website that you can find everything compiled? If you are going to share, I don't know, but it's uh, according to the, your policy of the Saudi society, if the presentation can be shared, my, I, 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 my presentation can be shared. So I think I added the links already in my presentation. Uh, but for the CSI, sure, I didn't add any because it's a confidential. This is like a, 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 a what's called it's, it. Ca it cannot be shared between it's organizations. Copyright. Yeah. Also, yes, yes, sorry, copyrighted. Yeah. And also, he can check the website and can purchase whatever he needs. But for other resources, which is free of charge, 
it's already in my presentation. So probably this is something that we can do in the Saudi Society of Clinical Chemistry to provide maybe uh, all the links that you can you can provide okay. that are free of charge uh, to enable, enable uh, that enables our colleagues to go through this process pain painful free. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and I don't be, don't be shy to 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 ask other laboratories who are accredited. You know, uh, can you please show me your quality manual, uh, just to get an idea? Yeah, you you're obviously not gonna copy and paste it exactly because you need to develop your own, but at least it will give you an idea how to go about it. So don't be shy of asking others as well. Mashallah, Muhammad is one very active. Another question: Can we uh, just get Sibahi accreditation if we have cap? Uh, the answer, the short answer is no. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, if you, if you already have uh, accreditation, this I get a bit the way to have more than one because they all share. You know, under underneath they have, you know, many of the standard already. Uh, they have shared. Maybe uh, th this question can be asked in another way. If you is there any accreditation? If you if you obtain, it will waive other. Uh, accreditation bodies against I guess CAB and uh, and and GSI I think GCI. in the United States are they can they can be waived. Yeah. So I don't have I don't see any more questions. Uh, and mashallah the participants are still one thousand five hundred and seventy. Uh, this is again uh, uh, talking of uh, success of this webinar. I hope that we have uh, addressed all of your point and made this, uh, uh, you know, it's not a scary journey. Uh, and this is again, a, a collaboration with our colleagues in the region uh, in United Arab Emirates. And uh, again, the Saudi Society of Clinical Chemistry is seeking to, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, share knowledge and across the region. So I guess I would uh, have to close uh, thank you all for our speakers, our uh, our uh, participants, and uh, for Al Burj Diagnostic and the Saudi Society of Clinical Chemistry for making this webinar uh, uh, possible and successful. Uh, so, if you uh, have any, if you want to have any comments, Dr. Leila, Dr. Ahmed, before we close. Thank you very, very much. And uh, again, I mean, uh, there is nothing impossible about accreditation. Just embark on the journey. And trust me, it's a very uh, rewarding uh, journey. So uh, I like to congratulate all the labs uh, and all the participants who are already uh, accredited and, and encourage the rest. And, and thank you all for your participation and for your dedication. Thank you, Dr. Zuhair, again for the invite. And it was a pleasure uh, sharing it with Dr. Ahmed. The pleasure is ours. Thank you. So again, we have 1,500 uh, committed uh, personnel to quality and, uh, and patient safety, let's say. Uh, I, I, I wish you all the luck and, and successful journey. And thank you all and have a, a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.